Welcome back. It's still me, Allison, here at NRPA, <laughs> and um, we are going to spend this session talking all about implementing nutrition education uh, and community and home gardening at your out-of-school time sites this summer and into the after-school program this fall. Um, so just a quick little overview of what I'm going to cover in this session. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the common challenges that we have seen from past grantees of the, as they have been implementing this program at their sites um, and some of those other common challenges that we hear from other out-of-school time providers when it comes to implementing enrichment activities and nutrition education. I'm also going to share some best practices, five best practices for implementing nutrition education at your out-of-school time sites. Uh, and these, again, have been things that we have heard from the field um, as they have reported back to us on their experiences. And then we're going to dive into the Foods of the Month curriculum, um, as well as the community and home gardening resources that you can access via your website. Um, and I'm going to actually walk you through finding some of those resources and how to access them. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the new resources that we are developing this year uh, that will be available to you as grantees, but also available to all of our park and recreation agencies on NRPA's website. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to focus a little bit on sharing your success as you implement nutrition education. But again, our marketing team is really going to dive into that a little bit later. So uh, let's start with some common challenges. And I think we have a poll that's going to come out here. Um, and, and actually, it would be great if in the questions box, you guys um, liked, would like to uh, insert some of those challenges that your agency has faced um, over the years. Um, some of the things that we commonly hear about is really balancing all of the different enrichment activities that you can offer at your sites. We know that parents and caregivers have a lot of demands about what takes place at your out-of-school time site and only a little bit of time to work with, especially during the after-school programs. So we know it can be a challenge to balance STEM, to balance physical activity, nutrition education, tutoring and mentoring activities, and of course, giving kids the opportunity to choose what they want to do in an out-of-school time program. So that is, of course, one of the challenges. Along those lines, we also hear about a lot of challenges using digital devices and screen times in out-of-school time programs. Uh, Ava and Daniel are going to dive into the HEPA standards a little bit later, but one of those standards does call for the reduction in screen time use during an out-of-school time program. Um, and we realize that that can be a challenge, especially when those screens and devices may be used for educational purposes. So we do have an exception for that. Um, but thinking about ways that you can use technology um, and digital devices for a positive purpose. So being mindful about that can really go a long way. We also know that funding is a huge issue. Um, for those people who may be tuning in who are not grantees and not receiving funding, we know that it can be a challenge to have the funds and the resources that you need to implement successful programs. Um, we recognize that things are uh, oftentimes expensive and staff capacity is limited. So we're going to talk about some of those strategies to address that challenge as well. Uh, and then again, as I referred to earlier, we know that making sure that kids are getting time outdoors is a big challenge as well. Um, if you think about kids during the school day, most of the time they are, it's spent indoors. So we know that outdoor activity is oftentimes uh, a priority for out of school time sites. But again, finding that balance can be a challenge as well. Um, so those are some of the common challenges that we hear about. Um, one other thing also being the quality of the food um, and the ability to get healthy food at your site. Um, thinking about celebratory events, thinking about staff um, training and staff role modeling. All of those things can be challenges for your out of school time program. Um, but what we want to do today is sort of work through some of those challenges, provide you with some best practices to address those, um, and then uh, really work to move that work forward. So there is a poll up right now. Would love to hear about what some of your biggest challenges are um, so we can really work to address those in the comments here. And I'll go ahead and jump in while you all are filling out that poll to some of the best practices that we have identified based on past work with our grantees um, in terms of implementing nutrition education. 
Um, so the first best practice I want to talk about is really developing a plan. Um, I can't express how important it is to really think about planning out your programs um, and determining how nutrition education will fit into your existing program schedules and the existing portfolio of work that you do. So really thinking about developing a plan um, and thinking about what staff are going to lead these efforts. Um, will there be a designated staff person at each site? Um, as far as a program schedule goes, how will the day be divided up? The, one of the HEPA standards calls for in an after school program, ensuring that kids are getting 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. And in a summer camp or a full day program that they're getting 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. So where are you going to fit that in? Think about your program schedule, take a look at it, um, determine if it's something that you want to uh, include um, for 30 minutes a day all at once, or if you want to break it up into 10 minutes a day. And that obviously the same is true for physical activity and nutrition education. Um, you can break it up, you can have it as an enrichment activity a few days a week for 30 minutes at a time, or you could do it 10 minutes a day each day. Um, in addition to uh, that developing a plan, we have seen a lot of success with agencies over the year who have taken this nutrition education curriculum um, and actually created a nutrition education binder based off of that um, and a notebook that their staff at each site can refer to. That includes the lesson plan guides, that includes the different activities. Um, staff are able to flip through the different themes and the different foods of the month to pick out what might be applicable for them. But that's all part of the planning process and making sure that you are prepared um, once these programs are up and running. And lastly, as part of developing a plan, um, we know that staff capacity is an issue. In fact, the poll that's coming in right now says that staff capacity is your biggest issue out there. Um, so think about uh, not only identifying staff that can lead these efforts, but who are the partners in your community that can also assist with nutrition education? Uh, and I'm gonna talk specifically about some great partner organizations that we've seen um, over the years uh, and how park and recreation agencies have started those partnerships with their um, local affiliates. So develop a plan, that is tip number one. Tip number two, and this is a big one as well, another best practice for implementing nutrition education um, is really thinking about positive role modeling. And again, we can't reiterate that enough. Um, role modeling is quite possibly the most important strategy in terms of the success of your nutrition education curriculum this year. Um, kids in your out of school time programs, you've probably seen it year after year, they look to your staff as their heroes, especially younger staff and staff that can really relate to them. Um, and if staff are not role modeling positive behaviors, um, then the kids will not want to do it as well. So as you're training your staff and coaching your staff this year, think about uh, making sure that they are eating and drinking healthy foods in front of the kids. If you are implementing a set of healthy eating standards uh, that calls for the reduction or elimination of sugary beverages and sodas, but your staff's walking in each day with a soda in hand, that message is gonna go a long way. So think about making sure that your staff, they are modeling uh, nutrition um, and healthy eating habits in front of your kids. From the physical activity side, think about making sure that staff are being active. Um, when kids are moving in your programs, staff should be moving with them. They should be participating in all of the games and activities if they're able to. So that's another big component that goes along with that role modeling piece. Um, more specifically, when it comes to nutrition education, things like taste testing, making sure that kids are trying new foods, um, encourage the kids to try new foods. If staff are sitting alongside these kids at lunchtime and they're taking a bite out of their salad, they're eating the tomatoes, they're eating the berries, they're eating the tropical fruits, kids are going to be a lot more inclined uh, to eat those foods as well because they wanna be just like their camp staff member. And lastly, with that positive role modeling, think about giving positive affirmations. Um, so really think about giving positive feedbacks to kid, feedback to kids when they are exhibiting good eating and physical activity behavior, uh, when they're eager to learn, when they're engaged in the conversation. Um, really think about encouraging staff to make sure that they are giving positive affirmations continuously. Um, so uh, tip number three is really focused more on youth. 
um, and listening to youth, listening to what they're interested in, um, and thinking about how best to engage teens in the implementation of nutrition education. Uh, over the years, we have heard from park and recreation agencies that have shared, you know, that this curriculum is really, really great for the school-aged child, but it might be a bit of a struggle to engage teens in some of these activities. So look to teens as potential leaders uh, and potential facilitators of these activities. Really engage them in the process. Empower them to bring their knowledge and their skills um, to your out-of-school time programs and to engage with younger kids in that program. Um, this is not only a benefit for the teen and providing them with some opportunities for uh, new skill building and uh, professional development and leadership, uh, it's again an opportunity for kids because kids are a lot more likely to listen and learn, for some, learn from somebody who uh, is positive about this and who is reflective of them. Um, so think about listening to youth and engaging teens. In addition to that, as you're listening to youth and engaging those teens, think about what they're passionate about. Um, think about bringing their passions into the program. Um, and I want to show you a video in just a minute here um, from an agency who was a 2017 Healthy Out of School Time grantee um, who really did a great job of bringing the kids' passions into their program. Um, so this was actually a camp that was focused on both healthy out of school time and music. Um, and these kids were really, really passionate about the arts. Um, and so the camp staff leveraged that and brought it into the program, combining their love for the arts um, and their love for music and their creativity and talent um, with their eagerness and willingness and excitement about learning about the foods of the month. So I'm gonna show you this video. Hopefully you all will be able to hear it here. Um, it's called Berry Fairy, and this is from Mooresville, North Carolina. Again, a grantee from 2017. All right, great. So um, as you can see from that video, what a great um, opportunity to engage older youth 
and teens and bring their passions and their talents to the table, um, even as you think about implementing nutrition education. Um, so think about that this year and really harnessing the power of your older youth, um, empowering teens to really take that active role, um, and asking kids what they like um, and bringing those to life through nutrition education. A couple of other uh, best practices here, uh, engage families. And we realize that can also be a challenge as well as a best practice. Uh, we know that engaging parents and caregivers is a continuous challenge for local park and recreation agencies, not only in terms of out-of-school time programs, but in other initiatives um, and offerings that you have. Uh, parents are busy and caregivers are busy. Uh, many of them are working full time or working more than one job. Um, and oftentimes it can be a challenge to get into a community center, a recreation center, um, or even a park uh, to not only pick up their kids, but interact with staff as well and really hear about what's taking place there. Um, but we do have some strategies around being able to better engage with parents um, and really meeting them where they are. Um, so if most of your parents are full-time workers uh, and don't have a lot of time to spend at your sites, maybe thinking about catering some family-friendly programs uh, to their schedules and thinking about offering programs on the weekend that might focus on nutrition education um, and healthy living as a family. So really think about meeting parents where they are. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to get out uh, and see a great program in San, in San Jose called Viva Calle. Um, and these were actually park activation events where the park staff brought out um, physical activity, games, um, wellness providers in the community to local parks in neighborhoods at hours where parents and caregivers were available. So it was a great opportunity to bring the whole family out for an evening of fun um, and connect them to some local resources, including nutrition education opportunities. So think about meeting parents where they are. In addition to that, think about what parents see when they come into your programs. Um, is there a family engagement board? Is there a bulletin board that parents uh, are able to actually see what's taking place at their site? Um, within this nutrition education curriculum and the gardening resources, we have numerous posters, we have newsletters included, we have activities targeted at parents and caregivers. Um, so make sure that those things are posted um, and widely available around your centers and your parks. Um, in addition to that, Think about hosting some family fun nights, some family friendly events. Many of you probably already do that, but take a nutrition focus on it um, and bring healthy foods into the program. Bring cooking classes, bring taste testing, bring activities from the Foods of the Month curriculum out uh, to engage parents uh, and caregivers and families of all shapes and sizes. And along those lines, I would also encourage you to think about making sure that all of those programs are inclusive of every skill level and every ability um, and making sure that all family members can participate in those programs. And I do see a question that actually came in. So remember, please chat in those questions um, as they come in. And I will address that right now. Hello, Melissa Kirkwood. Um, hope all is well. Uh, regarding an education binder, is there a template or examples from other participants that you can look at on online? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we actually have any examples on our website of the binder itself, but essentially what these agencies have done is that they have printed off almost every single resource from our Foods of the Month curriculum um, and actually divided it up into the different months and the different activities. Um, and utilize that at their program sites. So it's a lot of printing and it can be a lot of copying, um, but it was really well worth it for a lot of these agencies to be able to equip their site leaders and site staff with these binders that they were able to just flip through and pull out different activities. So we highly encourage that strategy. I think it's a great tool um, for not only planning, um, but being able to utilize this nutrition education curriculum successfully. Um, so the last best practice I'm going to share before I dive in um, to the uh, nutrition education curriculum and go through some of the resources that are included in there, um, it's really focused on sharing your successes. Um, so again, our marketing team is going to talk about some of those social media tips and tricks later this afternoon. Um, but think about, you know, always be sharing what you're doing at these sites. 
um, not only sharing with parents, caregivers, and families, but sharing with your leadership, um, sharing with city council, sharing with local policymakers, sharing with the local media. Um, oftentimes, the local media is really looking for stories in the summer months especially that focus on kids and healthy living. So this is a great opportunity to share what you're doing at your sites and maybe get some publicity out of it as well. So think about use that Instagram, use Twitter, use Facebook, use Snapchat, use all of those tools that are available to you to really communicate what you are doing um, that's really impacting the lives of these kids and providing them with access to healthy living opportunities. So now I wanna dive in to the Foods of the Month uh, curriculum here and uh, showcase some of the resources that we have as part of this curriculum. Um, it is a, uh, an evidence-based curriculum, and we actually know that because we have done a lot of research on this over the years um, and actually evaluated a lot of our grantees and the work that they've been doing. So we know that this curriculum has resulted in child improvements in both eating and physical activity behaviors, um, including increases in fruit and vegetable consumption with a specific focus on the foods of the month that are actually included in this curriculum. Uh, we also know that there have been increases in child and staff healthy living knowledge as well, which is an important component of creating those behavior changes later in life. A little more specifically, um, this curriculum is actually responsible uh, for some statistically significant improvements in uh, correct responses to nutrition education knowledge um, and those child eating behavior improvements, specifically increases in fruits, bell peppers, spinach, and low fat dairy products, and a decrease in sugary beverage consumption. Um, for parents and caregivers, this curriculum has made its way into the home and helped to reinforce those healthy living behaviors. Um, and we know that uh, parents have an increased knowledge of what their kids are eating and what they should be eating. We know that parents are better prepared to cook and prepare healthy foods at home. We know that parents are planting gardens at home, which is really exciting. Um, to hear, and we know that even parents' eating behavior improvements uh, have been made. There have been statistically significant improvements um, in vegetables, bell peppers, spinach, summer squash, and fish across parents. And one of the other uh, biggest groups to really benefit from this nutrition education component um, are staff themselves. So you all who will be implementing this program this year. I can't tell you how many stories we have heard from staff um, who have been really excited about this new um, dive into healthy living, who have changed their eating habits, who have lost weight, um, who have started working out and being physically active. Um, so staff really have uh, increased their knowledge of healthy living in terms of both nutritious foods and physical activity, um, and it's resulted in positive eating behavior improvements as well. So let's talk about the Foods of the Month curriculum because I know we are running out of time here. Um, so our curriculum is a free and totally downloadable uh, curriculum. It is all available on our website and accessible not only to grantees, but to anyone out there, any out of school time providers. Um, this curriculum is focused on two foods or food groups each month, um, healthy food groups. Um, and there is a whole suite of materials for each month that's included. So we have lesson plan guides, we have posters, we have newsletters to send home with caregivers, we have uh, USDA and MyPlate activities included, we have uh, coloring and experiential activities included, a ton of material for each month, and the curriculum is divided up into grades K through two, and grades three through five. And again, think about those older kids in your program as really being the leaders and facilitators of this um, and utilize them for that opportunity. One of the new things that we developed last year, which is really, really helpful, um, was actually a facilitator's guide for implementing this curriculum. Um, so this also lives on our website, our Nutrition Literacy and Community and Home Gardening Facilitator's Guide. Um, and essentially, it provides you an overview of the full curriculum, along with a breakdown of how best to implement this and how to utilize each tool. Um, so we highly recommend downloading that, printing it off, sharing it with any staff that'll be using the Foods of the Month and Community and Home Gardening materials this year. 
the calendar. Um, this is also available on our website, but you'll see on your screen that these are the 24 foods or food groups um, that we focus on each month. So most of these are seasonal um, and oftentimes grow um, in these seasons. So it's a great opportunity to, to connect that back to our gardening curriculum. Uh, but two healthy foods, food groups each month, we also do include oils and good fats um, and water as we feel those are important to address as well. So that calendar is available on our website. Um, you can print that off. We have it available as eight and a half by 11, but also poster size. So it's a really great thing to display at your site um, on a family bulletin board. The lesson plan guides. This is going to be your key to implementing this curriculum this year. So we have a lesson plan guide available for each month, one for grades K through two, and one for grades three through five. Um, so make sure to look through this. Essentially, it provides you an overview um, of what you can do each day of that uh, week. Um, so make sure to take a look through these lesson plan guides. It's got it broken down by coloring and activity sheets you can administer. It's got uh, it broken down as to when you can send home the newsletter with parents um, and all of the different activities that you can do at your site that month for these specific age groups. So it's a great tool. We also have monthly posters available. So there are uh, two posters for each month, one on each of the foods of the month. Um, again, these are available in eight and a half by 11 or uh, 15 by 20, so poster size as well. You can print those out um, and make sure to display them at your site so parents are aware of what's taking place. One of my favorite tools is the monthly newsletter. Um, and this is really a great opportunity to send this home with parents. Um, you can either have hard copies at your site. Um, you can uh, email these out as well. They're in PDF format, um, all available on our website. So feel free to download them, include them in an email blast each month to parents and caregivers um, so that they know uh, what you are doing at your sites. And there are also some great uh, tips and healthy recipes included in each of the newsletters. So it's a great opportunity to do one of those recipes at your out of school time site, but then have parents and caregivers reinforce that at home. Uh, and we hear that quite often that kids are taking home a recipe and the families are recreating it in the home. Um, so we have a little poll go going right now. Um, and again, looks like a lot of you have already read through our facilitator's guide, um, but make sure to check that out because it's a really great overview of all of the different tools that are included in this curriculum um, and how to utilize that. Um, and it is available on our website. I'm gonna walk you through that in just a minute here. Uh, we also have coloring and activity sheets available for the kids. This is really great a lot for the younger kids. Um, but basically we just want kids thinking about these foods all the time um, and thinking about healthy eating and taking something like coloring and arts and crafts that they may already enjoy um, and just putting that twist on it of thinking about the berries in June, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries. You just heard the berry fairies. Um, so, you know, think about printing off those. You can use those as part of a lesson plan as well. Um, and then another really great component, and this is where we get a little bit more hands-on, um, where the kids actually have the opportunity to um, be a little experiential with the food, um, keeping that theme going of just constantly surrounding them with these healthy foods and keeping it in their mind um, are the experiential activities that we have for each age group. Um, so these are things like different taste testing activities you can do, um, cooking, cooking lessons that don't require a lot of equipment um, or oftentimes even heat. Um, so there are things that you can do pretty easily at your sites, um, arts and crafts, and then connecting back to those core subjects of English, math, science, um, engineering. Um, so there are certainly activities that are really well connected to STEM and STEAM as part of this curriculum as well. So uh, we also have a lot of USDA and MyPlate resources included, um, which are great tools. Again, they're all evidence-based and packaged together for you, so you can easily download them and access them, but they have things like word searches and relays, um, tips on how to read a nutrition label, a lot of really wonderful resources that are available, and these are all included in that lesson plan guide. 
Um, we also have a physical activity component. Uh, we know that parks and recreation are really leaders when it comes to physical activity and ensuring that kids are running around all summer long. Um, but you know, there's a great way to be able to tie your existing physical activity work into nutrition as well. So think about games like um, red light, green light, and changing it to red pepper, green pepper, or just even making a little twist on something small. Great opportunities there to constantly infuse nutrition into your existing activities as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, we also have a specific resource that's focused on parents and caregivers um, and resources for the home. So all of those things are available on our website. In addition to the Foods of the Month curriculum, last year we heard a need for some additional resources and support around community and home gardening. We recognize that that can be a really effective tool um, to provide kids with hands-on experiences um, in not only growing their own food, but actually being part of the process from um, planting seeds all the way through harvesting and in some cases even composting. Um, on site. So we realize that not everyone has the ability to have a small community garden at their out-of-school time site, but it's a great tool when you are able to have that. Uh, and we've also included some activities that are more easily implemented in a classroom setting as part of this curriculum. Um, there are also uh, pieces here that are more designed for parents and caregivers, so things that you can take home and send home with parents to encourage them to start gardens at home. So similar to the Foods of the Month curriculum, we include a lesson plan guide, we include um, some posters, actually some seasonal gardening posters, uh, newsletters, coloring activity, uh, sheets, experiential activities, and then we also have some bi-monthly materials uh, and tip sheets on home gardening and community gardening as well. So it's a really effective tool to be able to utilize gardening um, in your programs. It might be a little bit hard to see, but each month has a different topic. Again, sort of focusing on what's happening um, seasonally uh, and in the gardening space. So make sure that you check that out on our website. I'll show you how to access those in just a minute. Lesson plan guides, again, broken down from grades K through two to grades three through five. Um, the seasoning gardening posters are one of my favorite resources. This is a really great uh, tool to be able to put on that family bulletin board. Um, again, you can print these off eight and a half by 11, send them home with parents and caregivers every season, put them in your email blast, uh, put them up on social media. They're all PDFs, so they can all go on social media. And again, you know, think about using the Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook and Snapchat to share these resources throughout the year. Monthly newsletters, uh, coloring and activity sheets, we've got it all here. Um, and because I want to stay on schedule, I'm going to go ahead and um, transition over to my screen uh, and share my screen with you all just so I can show you how you can access these resources. Um, we want to make sure that you are able to access them. So off of NRPA's homepage, which is Super easy to get to, www.nrpa.org. If you go to Our Work, and then under our NRPA Partnerships page, Initiatives. This is where you can find actually all of our NRPA initiatives and a number of resources available to you. So everything for the Foods of the Month curriculum and the Community and Home Gardening curriculum is branded um, under Commit to Health. So you'll click on Commit to Health today, um, and you will land on our main Commit to Health landing page here, where we have uh, everything you need to know to make your pledge to Commit to Health, um, everything you need to know to celebrate Commit to Health, what the HEPA standards are, and then of course the Foods of the Month curriculum and the Community and Home Gardening resources. So uh, the main page of the Foods of the Month curriculum has everything included on here, as well as some new videos that should be playing during your breaks. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see where you can download the facilitator's guide, um, which is a great resource, highly encourage that. We also have the calendar available on this landing page, so you can print it off as a poster or an eight by 11. Um, and then for each month, we have all of the materials included on here. Um, so January, February, all the way through the rest of the year, this is where you will find the individual materials for each of the um, months. And again, each month has two foods that are the main themes. We've got your newsletters, your posters, your experiential activities, your coloring and activity pages, and your MyPlate resources. 
um, as well as your fund being active resources. So everything is available there on the specific month. Um, so let's go back here to, oops, let's go back to our Commit to Health page. And I will show you where the gardening resources are as well. All right, so again, on that main Commit to Health page, we have all of your community and home gardening resources available. Um, so make sure you check this out. The facilitator's guide is also on here, but you'll click through to each month and May will be up there very shortly, so don't worry about that. Um, but again, it's got all of your resources, the lesson plan guides, the newsletters, coloring activity sheets, experiential activities, and more. So uh, that is where you will access all of the materials um, for both the community and home gardening resources and the Foods of the Month curriculum. And I want to talk a little bit now just about some of the new resources that we have coming back out um, in just a little bit. So. Some of the new resources that are coming your way. Um, we recently developed a passport to healthy living. This is a great tool that you can actually send home with your parents, caregivers, and kids in your program. Um, it's an opportunity for them to display it on their refrigerator at home um, and check off each of these boxes every week. So it's things like encouraging kids to go to their local park and play outside as a family, uh, to cook a healthy meal together, to go grocery shopping together, um, to make sure that they are being active and getting the recommended physical activity. So it's a great tool for you all to be able to use, to send home with caregivers, uh, and encourage families to complete this together. And you might think about offering an incentive um, if folks come back with it um, as part of your program. Uh, we are also in the process of working with our uh, evaluator, Dr. Danielle Holler, to create some new plant-based food guides, um, really focused on why it's important to uh, eat fruits and vegetables and uh, the benefits of a plant-based diet. Um, although we don't uh, recommend a specific diet, we're always thinking about accessing those fresh fruits and vegetables um, and just how good they are for kids and families. So we'll be coming out with some different pamphlets um, for several of the months that are focused on plant-based foods. And uh, in addition to that, we recently developed some intergenerational resources uh, that you all can use. We recognize that family units have really changed over time, um, and some are much more uh, intergenerational than they've been in the past. We recognize that a lot of times grandparents are the caregivers to kids in your program. So we actually have some healthy aging in parks, uh, lifestyle tips that we have developed, um, and they have four different topics. One is really focused on eating clean food and encouraging both adults uh, and kids to make sure that they're eating foods with as few additives uh, and processed um, inserts as possible. Uh, we also have one that's focused on maintaining a healthy weight and getting to that healthy weight by being physically active um, and maintaining a healthy diet. Uh, there's a great new tip sheet on sneaking in more fruits and vegetables into your diet. Again, this is applicable not only for older adults, but for family units as a whole. There are a lot of really kind of fun um, recipes on there, thinking about ways to just infuse more fruits and veg veggies into your uh, normal diet. Um, for example, thinking about pizzas. Kids love pizzas. Why not throw some extra veggies on there? Uh, and then lastly, there's a resource that's focused on stress management um, and in making sure that uh, people are being physically active and taking care of themselves so that they can take care of their kids as well. So um, those are some of the new resources that we have coming out. Um, and lastly, I'll just make another plug for as you're implementing the curriculum this year, please, please, please share your successes. Um, it is a great uh, opportunity for you all to share the work that you're doing, um, not only with parents and caregivers and families, uh, but with your entire organization, your entire community. Um, and if you use that hashtag commit to health and tag NRPA in all of your posts, um, we will repost it, we will share it. Um, we love nothing more than being able to see the images coming in of the work that you're doing in your communities. Um, so we already did the website walkthrough. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel free to chat them in. I did want to go back and just um, reiterate one last thing here. 
As you think about implementing nutrition education this summer and this fall in your out of school time programs, really think about ways to make it your own. Um, really think about ways to make it local and involve the local community, involve new partners um, in this work. Um, think about ways to make it fun and keep those kids engaged. Again, look at their passions, look at what they're interested in and bring that to the table. And you know, most importantly, have fun while you're doing this as well. Again, one of the biggest successes that we hear from our local park and rec agencies is how much this curriculum has impacted them in their own lives and how many healthy changes they have made. Um, so have fun with the kids, engage in this process, um, and really it'll be a great opportunity to continue to champion these efforts. Um, as far as timing of nutrition education, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can break it down 10 minutes a day. You can go all the way up to a few days a week, 30 minutes at a time, um, and look at your entire portfolio of what you do at your sites. Think about healthy celebrations, making sure that those are encouraging of healthy foods and you're not serving uh, foods that are bad for kids. Think about that role modeling component. Think about uh, using this as an opportunity to fuel a staff wellness movement. There are so many possibilities, so many ideas, uh, and so many opportunities. And lastly, I will just mention one last thing because I think it is so important. Um, partners are really the key to your success. Think about those partners in your local community who you can work with uh, to really give these kids the summer and the after school experience of their lives with a healthy, a healthy twist. Think about looking at extension offices, groups like 4-H, uh, maybe master gardeners if you have a, a senior program or a lot of volunteers, look to them. Think about grocery stores as a partner in helping to secure some of these fruits and vegetables for your program. If you have that small budget, a grocery store can actually donate that food and would be a great partner. Um, another great partnership, think about printing companies and local printers. Um, we realize that paper costs money uh, and printing costs money and that there are a lot of materials here. So think about really looking um, outside of the box and thinking about some of those creative partnerships as well. Um, another great example would be a local hardware store or a Lowe's or a home improvement to help start a community garden. They may even want to volunteer some staff um, to set up that community garden on a family fun day. Um, so there are so many opportunities. Um, think creatively um, and, you know, most importantly, reach out to us if you have questions. Reach out to our partners. Um, reach out to our other presenters that will be here today and past grantees um, and just keep that conversation going. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take a little bit of a break. We'll be right back in just a few minutes and we'll be talking about the uh, USDA Child Nutrition Programs.